Thank you for inviting me for this presentation. Today, what one of the topic I pick, uh, they call it convergence bidding, or sometimes you will hear it is some energy market, they call it virtual bidding. And this is one of the tools that this is an energy market, which kind of the trader that can use it and has some benefit for the electricity market. So I try to go through this concept from the energy market, why we have like a different system and converge it to this concept and show you some of the application that we are doing it. So overall, this is the area, as I said, I want to go through it pretty much as introduction to the energy market. So what is the energy market? Then we go and talk about the two settlement market, what's the advantage of the two settlement market that we have in the energy electricity market. Then talk about the convergence bidding and what it is, what's exactly why we need it or why we don't need it. Then in order to operate that one, then you need to have a two different concept of the, the forecasting and optimization in order to operate in this market. And the last, I guess, I talk a little bit about the company that I'm working. Any questions so far? So let's just talk about the electricity market. So what is the electricity market? Generally, there's what they call it independent system operator. It's a nonprofit organization that allows to buy or sell electricity through different markets. For example, these are the market currently it is deregulated in the United States. That there are some in Canada, Asia, and uh, even the Europe. But let's for now I focus on this market. As you see, there are a couple of markets on the California and Midwest, uh, PGM, New York ISO, and so on. So as I said, it's just a platform to trade the energy, to buy the energy at the wholesale. But it's not just energy because uh, in order to have the reliable system, you needed some other products. That I can, when it gets to that one, I'm gonna talk about those things too. So typically, as I said, why they started this electricity market? Because the whole idea, it was the many advantages that they can provide this electricity market or ISOs. First is efficiency, because when you are low in the deregulated environment, all the supplier and the demands come to the same location, and then you clear the market while you want to make sure your system is still reliable. So that efficiency is not just cost, but also, as I said, it's a reliability. And reliability in the wholesale, yes, one of them is, is to make sure the supply and demand and match, but that's not good enough because there is a contingency that could happen. There's a generator outage and what is gonna happen? So there are other products that uh, there are the kind of ancillary service or reserves, or even though for reliability, sometimes when you have a grid, the electricity grid, you have to consider what the, in the industry they call it N minus one, it's meaning what it happen if one line or one generator goes out, still you want to be your system reliable. So for that purpose, that's additional things that the market does. It's just, to me, that's the most important because otherwise you always have outages. <clears throat> the other one is the transparency because when you come to the market, uh, you want to make sure if you are supplier or for example, you are have a demand, you, you want to make sure that uh, you go through the central market. So there is no, uh, kind of the advantage or disadvantage to any market participant. So you can just simply come to this market and just trade the energy or buy or sell. The other one, it's the, what they call it risk management because what it happens in, let's say you have it several market. If you come to the real time, that's let's say next five minutes and you want to operate it, 
anything can go wrong. You know, in, it can be outage, it can be high prices. So it's, it's not always physical, but sometimes it's a financial. So you want to have a means and tools that, for example, you hedge your risks both in operationally and financially. And the other one, as I said, it's a market liquidity because when you create the several market, you allow to different participants, regardless they are, have the physical asset like a generator or a battery or a city, can be allowed to some people that are doing the arbitrage, just simply financial trading. So we get to that point why we need all this one. And again, the last one, the, the one of the advantage of the electricity market, it just, it creates a competitive environment for the, so it, it at least in the supply and demand, it allows the people to be competitive. It's meaning building new plant, building new battery storage, wind farm, and so on. So that's a, one of the, as I said, the main point of for having this electricity markets. So now we go to the next stop that I said. Okay, this is the like uh, this electricity market is a, like what I call it the high two settlement market. Sometimes it, it's it, it, it's more than two, but for now let's just uh, consider just two market. One there is the what they call it, like a forward market, which is on the day ahead. It's meaning for tomorrow you can come and trade energy, you can sell, buy, and you, you can do it. That's a, like a day ahead. And then there is a spot market for real time. Typically, this, there are like a five minutes ahead. Still, all these two market, they are ex ante, meaning still a little bit in future because you want to control it. So what it does in the day ahead, you can go and pre-schedule each of your asset for energy and ancillary service. Just go back to the ancillary service, as I said. Ancillary service in the wholesale, it's a, like a insurance. You, you ask some uh, asset, it can be load or generator, to put aside that capacity aside. And there's a market for it. Uh, and why? Because let's say suddenly load drops, or suddenly one big outage is coming, so you want that capacity be available. But that capacity is not always outages because what it happens if suddenly one wind generation created tons of energy. So you want someone to consume that one. So this capacity can be positive, it's meaning generate, or it can be negative. So having said that, that ancillary service, that the, the one of the main advantage of the wholesale market. And actually you see that capacity, that as they say, sometimes the prices is, are very high, as high as its energy, I mean, even though, because you are providing the insurance for the system. And then when it comes to the real time, which is, as I said, like a next five minutes, then this is a for adjustment, which is, which allows you to whatever decision that you made in day ahead, you adjust it, for example, increase or decrease the generation. And so, so to, to show it in the some sense is a like if you have a day ahead market that you are running it for tomorrow. So there's a like early market for tomorrow. Then when it comes to the today, now we have a, like a small real time market. So this is like a kind of a structure of the two settlement market. But some other market you can see, they have it uh, more than two. For example, they have a day ahead, they have an hour ahead, they have a real time too. So for now, let's just stick with the two settlement market. Any questions so far? So let's look at the what is the day ahead market. So what is in the day ahead market? What, what is the purpose of the this day ahead market? Again, as I said, the purpose of this day ahead market 
it's the mechanism to allow you to hourly schedule for energy regulation and ancillary service for the next day. So it's just like a market that you come and it allows you to trade. The other things, as I said, it helps the participant hedge against any volatility in the real time. Because if the head is a very, I wouldn't say, is as volatile as the real time, because real time, anything could happen. But day ahead is a financial, this means the people come and buy and sell the energy. So for example, if you want to hedge uh, any risk, it allows you to go to day ahead and you trade. And you come in real time, maybe there's a little bit of adjustment if you want to do, for example, sell or buy energy. So at the same time, as I said, it allows you, if you are a system operator, to have the better understanding if you want to plan for the next day or week ahead and any forecasting that you want to do. So you, that's the main purpose that allows you to go and trade the energy in the end. Then talk about the process. So what is the process? So each market participant. So market participants, anyone that it can have the physical asset, the generator, battery storage, or it can be financial trader. Pretty much it's meaning it comes selling day ahead and buy back in the real time. So it's just purely financial. They, they need to provide the bids and offers. So typically bids is for demand and offers are for generation. Then at a specific time that they call like a gate closure, the market, the ISO, it's closed and it is kind of like a dodge auctioning. So what it is, it, it runs the market, it calculates the prices and uh, provide this solution to the participant. And it can be, as I said, it can be generator, it can be retailer, which is like a load, it can be financial trader, the one that are arbitraging or large consumers like uh, cities. One of the major things of the, the second portion that I said, the market, the market is not, it's a very different from the perspective of the, like if you look at like a stock market, it's not like a stock market. Because in order to solve that one, each of these assets, they have their physical characteristic. So for example, let's say you have a generator, that you want to ramp up from 50 megawatt to 100 megawatt in within the R. Sometimes it's not physical. So the, the other one, let's say you have the big uh, battery that you are discharging and suddenly you cannot switch it to the charging. Or the network, all this transmission line that you can see, they can pass certain amounts of the megawatt. So there is a, like a big, software that it, uh, I get to that point, I'll explain it. Uh, so having said that, that's, that's actually, it's a complicated thing. So that's the reason each entity or country or state, they have their own uh, clearing engine and that's require a lot of work to develop those tools. And again, back to the last or what's the importance, as I said, allows you to, uh, it allows the day ahead that the price in day ahead uh, kind of the alleviate some of the uh, kind of volatility that it can be in real time. You can remove it because by trading in day ahead. And it allows you to commit some of the generation. Why I emphasize on the commitment, because again, as I said, if it's a financial market, some of the generator you, you cannot commit it on demand. It takes hours to commit it. So if if it comes to the real time and we don't commit that one ahead of time, definitely we will have outages. So one of the main advantage of the day ahead is meaning it allows you to commit to tell that generator to be online at certificate at a specific time. So that's a, one of the major things of the day ahead actually is, is through all these things that I said, but the main point from my perspective, it's a commitment. You make sure those assets are available at the real time. Sure. 
to understand data and market, it's not known like continuously by expense, but there's like a certain time where the prices are broadcast. Right? Um, is there ever a case where because of something that happened on the grid, the prices become invalid or those are you committed? Like, let's say it's announced right at noon, but uh, shortly after noon, something catastrophic happens. Are those prices now invalid for the next few hours or those are like set? Those are those are valid because that that's a, if you are talking about day head market, this one is gone. It's meaning, let's say by ten a.m. they start the market by one p.m. the market and they clear, and that's become like a financial obligation. Again, I emphasize that point. It's a financial obligation. It's not physical yet. So having said that, yes, and remember, all these markets they have a price cap, so it's not like a price goes to infinity. So it 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 everything has a price cap, so each market has a price cap. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Is, is the day ahead market being utilized across America or just in some markets? In some markets, uh, remember the the map that I show you. So each of them is an independent system operators, so they operate in that territory. For example, so it's one for example simply for California. So the California orange splotch that has, has a market. Yes, exactly. And it has their rules and so on. Yes, uh, just on a small point, so whenever, like, for example, a generator is paid for offering, like they're offering like uh, a megawatt, but like a, a fixed output for like an hour or just for five minutes the next day, or is it like they bid every 24 hours? Yes. Good question. They had what they provide, you provide the offer for the, all the hours in the next 24 hours. If you don't offer, you, you are not going to select it. And then when it comes to the real time, yes, still you can provide your bids and offers because you are saying, in addition, whatever decision you made in day ahead, if you want to change me, this is the cost, this is the price I pay or I debit or credit it, for example, yes. So I guess I go to, uh, I don't know, what, uh, for example, there is something always in the uh, energy industry that are talking about this security constraint unit commitment or SCOC. And that's the main engine that the market draws. That was the, by most of the work, it was actually in this core engine. I mean, the most of the market that I worked, my responsibility was the core engine of this market. So typically, what is the security constraint unit commitments? Unit commitment, as I said, is known. It's meaning it's you allow the some generator to be online or offline. It's a, like a mixed integer programming. But what's the security constraints mean? Because you have a network, you have a grid. You cannot transfer the infinite of the energy. Or, for example, the flow follows the, some physical rule, the network. So having said that, so what we can do that if you combine network with the unit commitment, then it's become the call is security uh, constraint unit commitment. Typically what it does, as I said, they have a set of the inputs, which is the energy bits and offer, generator load operational constraint. Remember that I talk each asset has a, it's a physical, it's meaning it's, it's you cannot wrap it up or you cannot turn it on. So all this constraint goes into the optimization. Then you have ancillary service offers, which I mentioned, it's meaning all like insurance. You can have a load forecast. For example, you are forecasting tomorrow, this is gonna be the load in the California or in a specific portion of the California. Then you have a requirement, for example, for ancillary service. So because you are saying, well, what is the requirement for ancillary service? Let's say if you are saying, put this capacity aside. Based on the, there is a, there is a uh, FERC or NERC, which is a, uh, belongs to a, a North America Reliability uh, Committee. So what they do, they define it. They are saying, it, what is the requirement? Consider like a biggest generator that you have in your system. And if that one goes out, you need, at least that amount of the capacity you put it aside. So they have some requirement. Or even though if that capacity is, for how long you have to support it? Four hours, one hour, two hours, all of those one, it goes to, to this one. 
And I said the network model. Network model is the whole grid system. For example, let's say in Texas, we are talking about around like 10,000 transmission lines. So each line has its own characteristic. And so you have to model all those things. The other one that I said, I guess I added here, they call it CRR or there is some kind of like a congestion revenue, right? It's a kind of, there is a path that you transfer the energy and you buy that right to transfer that energy. And whatever the price differences, for example, you can, uh, for example, either get that uh, profit or buy that pass because you have sent the energy from one point to another part and you want to hedge your, uh, you kind of want to hedge your risk. But again, we can skip that one for now. That's a totally different topic. Those are the inputs that typically goes to the this uh, SUC model. And typically what's the outcome? It's a commitment pattern, as I said. Uh, load and generation uh, for both ancillary service and energy, and the prices. You see, if I set the prices, I put the LMP, which is this is what they call it, location and marginal prices. It's meaning in any part of the network, let's say at Stanford, the energy can be different from the San Francisco. And that's purely because the way that you can transfer the energy. So the other part that I show typically, what is this CUC is? Typically, if you want to solve that one, it's, it's a non-convex mixed integer programming. But the issue is here, the size of the problem is so huge. For example, if you want to just model the network model, we are talking about this in Texas is a five million constraint for each R. And typically, this is kind of problem that you have to solve with the whole thing is you have to solve with, let's say, 10 minutes. So having said that, because it's, it's, it's operation, you, or even the way it goes to real time, the whole thing is supposed to run 30 seconds. You don't have the, the whole day to solve it. So having said that, so <coughs> typically, we decompose this problem in two different modules. One is what I call is network security analysis, which is the, like a, a power flow. Uh, power flow is a, is a part of like a power system engineering that when you inject the power, it tells you exactly how much the flow is each line. And that one, for example, uh, can see which line create any congestion. It's over its limit. So what it does, it creates a subset of the constraint. And the unit commitment, which is the simply is a mixed integer programming that have all this constraint, it solves it, it creates a schedule for each generator or asset, send it back to the network security constraint, it checks it, whether it's, it's, uh, it's any more violation. If, if there is a more violation, it's create a set of new set of the constraint. So this one is goes around until the whole thing is become uh, feasible. So that's the only way that literally uh, we can solve the the system in a certain time. Because I know there are talk in the industry about OPF and so on. Those of the thing in industry you cannot use it because it's just problem is too big and you have a limited time. Any questions so far? There's a hand on the Zoom. Uh, someone so, put their hand up on Zoom. Oh, no, that is one. Well, so what's the next one? I guess that's, that's a real-time market. That's the one that uh, I said typically it balances the supply and demand at the real time. But again, real time, remember, I'm talking about next five minutes. It's not real, real time because you need to have to run your optimization and later we get we explain what is that and send a signal to all this asset and then they have to pick it up. So they need a couple of minutes to do the, so typically they scheduled for the next five minutes. Some of the market, they can go up to 
next hours every five minutes. Like in New York, they can go up to the four hours. The first two hours is a five minutes. After that, the decision is a 15 minutes and so on. But the more outlook you have into the future, the, the better, the more reliable. But again, it depends on the system operator. For example, in Texas, they just look at the next five minutes. Whether it's good or bad, that's their decision. <laughs> and as I said, a still real-time market, you want to be your system reliable. It still is a physical system. Anything can go wrong. You want to make sure you still provide energy to everyone. And the process is a very similar to the day ahead. Uh, you have to still support the, the bids and offer for any additional change that you want to do on top of day ahead. If you don't want that, that is okay. So you can just carry over your decision financial to the physical. And, but in real time, still they can tweak some of the things. For example, there are some units that call it quick start. It's meaning within the 10 minutes, you can start it. You don't really want the day ahead make a decision for those units because they are too fast. So you let this decision carry over to the real time. And those of them mostly are like a battery storage or gas generation that can come. To. But the one that there is no uncertainty. So quick start cannot be a wind farm. And in addition, some of the ancillary service that I said that you capacity, they can carry over to real time too. For example, there is a couple times I say the call regulation. It's meaning if there is a sudden change in the demand, there's no outages. For example, suddenly everyone watching the World Cup, they, they turn on the TV, the, the consumption goes up. So you need something fast. And that's what the call regulation is mean very fast. Within a second, you can come back. Those capacity can be clear in real time in addition to the day have to. And again, the important thing, as I said, every single real time is a physical. It, there is no financial because we are talking about next five minutes. So any decision we make, everything is a physical. It, it's meaning the participant or operator has to follow that instruction. And again, the importance, as I said, the main importance is its reliability and stability of the grid. That's the way we want to approach for the next uh, five minutes. And one of the things, as always, as I mentioned, real time prices are very volatile because of the, it, it's a physical, anything could, could go wrong. I mean, literally, if you see the prices, it just every five minutes are very different. Not very, but they still are different. So the next, go back to the next one. That is what I, I guess everybody does say they call it a scare or security constraint economic dispatch. It's a pretty much, it's a similar to the SCOG. The only difference is here, you, uh, it's, not, it's not like a mixed integer programming. It's just simply, it's like a linear programming because most of the commitment is, is a decided by there. Those of the one that it creates the, uh, you need to mod it as a kind of integer or or binary decision. In here, all these decisions are continuous. It's but again, it's not convex. It's a non-convex system. So having said that, the same concept you have the set of the energy bits and offer for any change that you want to do in top of the day here. You have all this operational cost. And then you have a commitment pattern. Same thing for a SCAT, which is very similar to as you see. The problem is so big. And we have, remember like in Texas, you have a 10 second to solve the whole grid. So that's the only way that you could solve it. So going through the, this, uh, as I said, now if you talk about all these two settlements, we go through pass, pass through this one. Again, the reason why we went to the two settlement they had real time because of risk management, price stability, 
and I guess efficiency because because if you promote competition and liquidity, the other one is stability, is meaning if you bring the sum of their bids and offer, your day hit energy prices and real time, they're gonna kind of converge. You get to that point, that's the reason they call it convergence bidding. Any questions so far? So now we went through the, the market and we went through the two settlements, so everything is good. So now back to the topic of this presentation, let's talk about what is the convergence bidding. So the first is convergence bidding, also known as the virtual bidding. It allows the participant to submit bids or offer, I mean like a generation, right? on the day ahead, without intending to physically produce or consume any energy. So whatever you do in the day ahead, let's assume if you sell, you buy back the same amount on the real time. So, so it's pretty much you are not responsible to provide anything. So you may say, so what's the purpose of it? The purpose, as I say, simply is arbitrage between price difference between day ahead and real time market. And uh, this one, as I said, is the financial position take a dam and liquidated in real time. So it means whatever decision you make in day ahead is going to be opposite in the real time. So as you see here, I have the, I put this one of the price in the Houston hub in Texas. And as you see this blue line, it actually shows the day ahead market prices. And this one is the real time market prices at that day. So typically, if that's the case, if you have these tools, typically you want to sell it in day ahead and buy it back in real time. And you take this difference as a profit. So, so in this case, you are kind of your, your position is just short. It's meaning you are selling. So for example, at whatever what these are, like at the beginning of the day, you want you can do it a long. I mean, you can buy it in the day ahead and sell it in real time. And you take that difference as a profit. So, so, so what's the advantage as you see? It, it, it creates a, the one that I said, it creates a liquidity. The more we have this convergence to bidding, it causes these prices converge to each others. But one of the main advantages that typically people are not talking about the papers and so on, is the convergence bidding allows you to commit the generation debt. Because if there was no convergence bidding, nobody uh, bid in the day ahead, no generator is committed. <laughs> so, but again, some other market, they allow to bring the sum of the load forecast in day ahead, some market like a Texas, it doesn't. Literally, there is no load forecast. Everything is a bids and offers. Uh, as I said, it means simply how this uh, virtual bid or convergence bid are working. Typically, in the day ahead, you submit your bids and offer, but whether you are long or short, and then you, you buy or sell. So everybody can send the bids and offers. Then the market clears in day ahead, based on the, the one that I show in the SCOC that comes and award you some physical uh, megawatt, either says you have to sell the energy or you have to buy the energy. So that's your that's your position. So in day ahead, it tell you the awards. And still you don't know whether you you profit or you, you lose money. Then it comes to the real time. So whatever position in the real time, it looks at the real time prices. And whatever position that you had, it assumed it's the opposite. So, so for example, as I said, it's gonna take an opposite side. For example, if you are winning the offer, if they had, they must be buy it back in real time and vice versa. And you have no control on real time. It's meaning yeah, whatever awarded, it has to be opposite. So you are the real time, you are price taker. 
you, you have no control. So that's that's a, another risk because you may end up losing money because you have no control. So typically, as I said, uh, when you are doing this conversion building or ritual, these are the key points that you do. As I said, you simply, you can be profit or loss if, for example, if you are have offering the energy or you are buying the energy. For example, when you offer, the profit is going to be they had prices minus real-time prices times whatever I wanted. So that's what it is. And as I said, simply can be profit or loss. The second point, as I said, the physical delivery, it doesn't involve any uh, physical del delivery for this one. So it's a purely financial. It's just, so any trader can come and arbitrage between these two. So again, by arbitrage, that's what I said, it caused the uh, price convergence between real time and there. Because if you didn't have that one, I mean, you see the price of the real time and there is why it's going to be a big gap because most of the participants, they don't come in there. They just come in real time. There is a, another thing that I guess I just want to mention in the financial market. There is a lucky, like if you look at in the, there's a market in the East Coast called PGR, which is one near New Jersey, I guess, Maryland. What they do, there's a, something they call it up to congestion. Imagine now, instead of the buying a day ahead and selling a real time, now you do four pair. In day ahead, you sell in one point, buy back <laughs> at, uh, at another system, the network, and the real time just do opposite. So you are arbitraging on the price differences, not on the prices. Again, I just wanted to mention there are more tools uh, that just I, beside the virtual bidding, but this is one of the financial tools that we can do. There are more into it. So up to now, I just said, okay, this is the market. This is a two settlement market. And these are the tools that, for example, anybody can come and use and trade. But let's say now we come to the point that I'm an entity that uh, I want to trade in that market, for example. So in order to, to do this uh, trading, the main things that you see in that equation, you have to forecast the prices. Price forecast in electricity market, it, it's it's a complicated because is let's say you have the network and tomorrow the topology change, one of the line or outage. If you have any normal machine learning network that you train your system it's become meaningless because it's not the same thing. It's not the, literally the same system, it's just totally different system. And this topology is changing. I mean, some of the market literally, the operator keep changing the topology, not because of the outage, because by changing the topology, they can relieve some of the congestion. So having said that, so if I'm a trader, so what is the important for me that it's a, it's a accurate forecasting, it's meaning if I want to forecast. So I have to make sure that I forecast the prices that exactly represent that physical and structural market. It's not just a human behavior, it's the physics behind it. That's actually even tougher than to human behavior, the way that two bits an offer, you can predict it. But very unknown that happened, it's very hard. And as I said, so if you accurately forecasting like a prices or anything, it helps you to manage your financial risk because if your forecast is bad, you may end up losing money in the system. And at the same time, it allows us to plan how, for example, how we should operate in this market. If, we should, if our forecasting is good, in some specific how we should operate it, that we should eat, offer, and so on. And the last part, if we can accurate forecasting, definitely 
give us the competitive advantage because it allows us to uh, profit more from the market. While again, you remember this financial tool, it, it, it is not, it's not a bad tool. It's actually it allows the system uh, to operate better at the real time. So what is our forecasting model? For example, as I said, up to now we said, okay, it's, it's a forecasting model. One of the things that I guess we are using, we are using this uh, generative AI. This is a kind of like, as I said, it's artificial intelligence. And it, it can capture the pattern and the structure. That's the key word that I said, because in the power system, the, the structure is very important because if there's something in topology change, as I said, your price forecast can be totally wrong. And one of the, the other advantage of this generative AI, it allows you to use it as the different stage for different, uh, for example, forecasting. You, you may need just a price model, price forecast, but we figure it out if you have the power, which is meaning we forecast what is the solar generation tomorrow, what is the wind generation, and so on. And if you fit this one to the price model, actually we can forecast the prices better. So, and I guess last talk it would be optimizer that I guess we talk, I talk about it later that what is that one means. So I guess, as I said, imagine you have a system that uh, we are talking about many nodes that I can trade and the next 24 hours after forecast both day ahead and the real time. And my forecast has to be probabilistic. And again, the correlation of probability between their prices is a physical. It's not something like you can define the copula and said, okay, this is how you create a correlation. It's actually, it's a physical. So the physics and the structure of the network correlate the prices. For example, if there are two nodes that electrically close, they can be thousands of miles away. The prices can be seen. So having said that, so that correlation and everything, that's a part of the things, this model that we are using. Any question? So as I said, so one of these forecasting application that we do, it's a, it's a demand forecasting, or it can be renewable forecasting, or it can be a pricing. So anything can be that one. So we use all this forecasting as a tools that we can use to trade in the market. So let's go now to the last part that I said is a bid optimizer. Now, okay, we have all this forecast and let's say we are trading on 100 different nodes in the next 24 hours. And for each of these one, we have 100,000 scenario because it's a, it's a probabilistic sampling. And now we want to solve that one. So in this case, we are using some concept of like a portfolio optimization that we have the, some risk measure. Typically we use a, any coherent risk measure, which is because it's a well-behaved, it's a convex. And we can do this, this one to create this uh, portfolio optimization. So portfolio optimization gets all these price forecasts and creates a bits and offers. In addition, we have the, another set of the constraint, how much you can bid, how much you can offer. Then this is a totally automated. So it goes through this one. And as I said, in here, typically it can be, it's like a stochastic, it can be linear, it can be quadratic based on uh, if you have, you want to know the market impact because if you offer 1000 megawatt in one location, definitely the prices are gonna go down. So having said that, we consider all this one and we create the bid and offer. So by after by creating this bid and offer, then we can submit this one to the NISO and uh, they clear. So that's a way, for example, we operate for the convergence bidding. 
the so as I said, I was just showing one of the example. As I said, we have a price prediction for day head real time. Then we have the speed optimization, speed optimization create a curves. All these curves again are convex or concave based on the bids or offer. Then we send it to ISOs. ISO provide the award. Then real time happens. Then whatever happens, if I didn't make a profit or lose money. So for example, you see in here, typically when it's a positive, it's uh, it's meaning that if we are short and this one is long. So it's meaning here, like this R at nine, we purchase around like a 1000 megawatt of the energy on day head. And the reality, this is like a profit and loss. This is like a profit we make and in a couple of hours, we lost money. But overall, that's how we, we are doing it. And that was just the a structure of the, the market that we are operating. But typically how we do it, and literally it is autonomous. It's, that is, uh, this is a, most of the, our operation in the market, it's uh, through the, what they call artificial intelligence. We have a nat natural intelligence too, which is the, the traders we have, but most of the, our income comes from the, this concept, which is every day at the, we start training a model. You may say, why are you train every day? Because if you train your model, you can keep using it. Remember the point that I said, the system is very dynamic. Anything could happen. So you want to know, you want to train your model based on the latest and the greatest of the data. Then you train your system. Then you take the samples. So you get the sample from this distribution that you train. Then you optimize it, which is about the stochastic optimization. It creates a bit of offer. Then we, this is at 10 a.m. Let's say we submit this one to the aircraft, which is in Texas, and they clear it. And the next day, because real time is happening next day. So when that one is finished, they settle it. So we know whether it be lost or gain money at that day. So, so far, that's pretty much is conclude my presentation, the convergence bearing before I getting into the more what we do. Any further question? Um, are, you, are you training a model? from the ground up every single day? Or is it yes. like a standardized and you're kind of fine tuning some of that? Yeah, it'll be trained. It literally be trained from the yeah, from scratch. scratch. That's what I'm saying. Because if you don't, especially grid, it's, it's extremely nonlinear. It's, it's very hard to train because as I said, if the topology change or some big outage isn't happening, pretty much all the training done is just meaningless. There's enough data in a day to. True. Yeah, you have a set of the data that you can use using that knowledge. But for example, congestion pattern is not something that, uh, for example, if you look at the when there's a line congested that it creates a price difference. If you want to train it, you see most of the time it's just not congested. So if you go last 10 years, you know what I'm saying? You don't have that much data. So we use some extra information. That is a base of the fundamental that we can allow this training. So it's it's a kind of what I call it grid ever training. So it has the knowledge of the grid. I think mean, you sort of answered this, but it sounds like like you're not at getting grid topology data directly. You're inferring it from the data while you're training. Is that correct? We get the network data directly before less some of the market business, your participant, the, uh, the ISO share you the, the network topology in some extent. Again, to some extent. Some of the things like a, some generator outage because generators are controlled by some private company. They may not reveal it, but we can understand it because there, there is a tools, a lot of means that we can understand it. So it, it's a, it's a lot of the processing before even do this training. So the features are very important. So some of these features, that's a kind of our IP. 
Can you write, uh, how much better is like the latest training model versus the model one day before versus the model for example one fly like one or all of the, all of the, the last week? Good question. Typically, if there is not much volatility, like uh, let's say you are in the fall and the spring, uh, because there's enough capacity or uh, the load is not that much high, you don't see a huge difference. But the big difference is especially in the summer, let's say in Texas. And that's the one that actually most of the trader or operator, they, they can make money because but those ones then the day to days can be very different. Go ahead. So, um, so like ideally it's like if you could see the future then you can do everything perfectly. But could there be like bad actors someone could go in and uh, 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 uh go in and manipulate the the, the market in Good question. There is a, each market has something they call market monitoring. Market monitoring actually goes and look at all this data. So look at for any collusion or tacit collusion. And they stop them. I mean, and it happens. I mean, I later get, we, we have a bad news storage. They come and ask you why you did it. Prove it's really. And again, it depends on the market. If you go to Texas, they are very relaxed. <laughs> If you go to, let's say, New York, they are very hard. Can you talk more about the just the real life application that to Gridmatic? Do they have battery storage in Texas and California? I, I get to that point. Yes, all right, next please. So this is the typically, uh, as I said, uh, we are the a group of the people. Typically, we have different background. We have, we have a three different group, which is AI, energy, and market. More, our AI TV, typically most of them comes from the Google and Meta. And we have, a, I would say, 70% of our engineers are from the Stanford. <laughs> but that's the reason I put the Stanford over there. And the energy we have, the, all these people that work in different companies in the energy and the markets. And what we do, I guess that's the bottom line. The first part that I show you, this trading, that's the one I kind of explained. But again, the one that I explained was a full picture. I said, I said, there are many other financials too. I just talked about one of them. The other one, I guess to answer your question, it, it's a physical asset. We have the storage. We have a storage both in Texas and California. They are like a hundred megawatt hour bands and they are operating. Those are there even more, I would say, it's complicated that, that, that the trading because those are a physical asset. You have to carry over through their head, real time, and they are physical. And for example, remember I said ancillary services. On trading, you cannot trade ancillary services because you are not financial, but in physical, you can provide ancillary services. Actually, battery storage is the main source of their income is actually providing that reliability to the system. So everybody thinks that the storage is just arbitrage, charge and discharge. Actually, we don't charge and discharge. <laughs> just, I can show you, just pretty much, you are saying that we just provide the reliability to the system. That's what one of the things, as I said, and that's, that the storage is, it's, I, I can say, is five fold, fold more complex than this trade because that requires a lot. It's a real time operation, it's a different from financial operation. And the last part is the other one that I guess started, which is on the retail side, as I said. So on the retail side, you can go and uh, provide the energy to the uh, big factory, big city, or anything can be. But what we do, we provide the flexibility. Sometimes there's a data center that it says, no, we want to be uh, carbon free. So we, we, we have a contract with the engineers and we match it. So that's very important to make sure. And if here, our person is like a near 90% that we can guarantee that is a clean energy. The other one is the flexibility. That for example, we sell the price at the discounted price 
why but we get the flexibility we are saying it okay we sell you 10 percent below market what allows us to curtail you and that curtailment remember we have an ancillary service we can provide it as the insurance and liability to the system and that's the way that we make the difference for example because so that's the retail side so as I said, the most complicated one is the storage. Then retail, the easiest one is the, uh, the, the dating site. Um, follow up. So since you have storage, how do you lose money in trading if you can bid day ahead? And if the real-time market is low and you would lose money, you just keep it in storage until the prices go back up? Good question. But remember, on the financial trading, you have no control of the real time. Whatever position you do, because you tag it as the financial trade, ISO comes and says you have to do reverse. But, very good question. There is something that I call it implicit virtual conversion. Meaning, you can use the battery for that purpose. It's meaning you can say, you say they come to the real time sell price is very high, never mind. <laughs> exactly. Is it, yes, that's what I call it implicit. Is, is it meaning internally you are still this is a financial? Market doesn't know about it. Yes. Very good question. So, having said that, one of the things that I wanted to show you, I guess, this is the, in Texas, the, the market is open to pretty much all the data is the public. So what we, I show you is just in the Texas market. And we, you see the line that I show you, this is a Gridmatic. This is our company. That we just started like a, really uh, using this trading as you see near end of the 2021. And that's accumulated profit that we made. Now we are number one. Uh, we are a very small company. We are like 25, 30 people. But compared to all this big trading, for example, company, now we are number one. We actually made money more than anybody else takes off. And other markets. But I just wanted to show you this data because it's public. We can just see. And truly because we are using the AI and optimization the way as I explained it. And it literally is autonomous, most of our trade. That's pretty much conclude my presentation.